<clears throat> well, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for being here at Civic tonight. We're so glad that you're here. It's great to see all of your faces. For those of you who I have not met before, my name is Christina Gibson, and I am the Outreach and Development Coordinator here at the Chattanooga Design Studio. Um, we also have our other team members here, Eric Myers and Lindsay Wilkie, and Beverly Bell is unable to be here tonight, um, but also shout out to Beverly. And I, one of our current um, fellows is also here tonight, Erica Roberts. Where's Erica? There she is. <laughs> and last civic speaker. If you, didn't, if you didn't catch the last civic, there's a recording of it on our YouTube channel with Erica. I highly recommend it. It was fantastic. We're the Chattanooga Design Studio and we are a nonprofit resource here in the community promoting excellence in urban design through education and collaboration and facilitation. I want to give you guys a couple updates about some projects we've got going on right now that we're excited about. Um, the Porch Project, which is a public space pilot project over here at the corner of Georgia Avenue and Market is moving forward um, with the patent residents. They're really enjoying that space now that they're being able to start moving back in after the fire that, was hap that happened this March. Um, but we're gonna be moving into data collection about how that space is being used, how that public space is being used to sort of replicate things that are working there in other public spaces around town. So there will be volunteer opportunities coming up soon for um, helping us collect data and observe how that space is being used. So keep an eye out for that. Um, we're also very proud and excited about the developments with the planning processes on the west side. Um, we are currently working with the UTK School of Architecture. Those fourth year students are helping to develop some plans for the James A. Henry building, which is a historic building in the west side that has a lot of potential to be repurposed and revitalized and redesigned and reimagined as a community hub for the west side. So stay tuned about that. And um, also we've got our next Civic coming up. I wanted to give you guys a heads up on November 18th. So save the date. It'll be a Thursday evening just like this. And the topic will be planning for local food systems. And we're gonna be partnering with Crabtree Farms. I know we've got Melissa I think is here. And it will be held at Crabtree Farms for a little fall open air soiree with fire pits and whatnot. So bundle up and save the date for November 18th for the next Civic. Um, also, want to give a big thank you and shout out to our partners and sponsors for making this possible. The Lyndhurst Foundation, thank you so much um, for making it possible for us all to be here to gather for these civic events. Um, thank you to the Trust for Public Land for helping us uh, put this particular program on. So big shout out to the Trust for Public Land. As well as River City Company for hosting us in this venue. And uh, last but not, but not least, Five Wits Brewing for providing the beer. Yeah. Um, for <laughs> awesome. Cool. Well, that's enough for me. Um, thanks again for being here tonight, y'all. Um, it is now my absolute honor and delight, and I am, I am humbled to introduce to y'all our speaker tonight. Rhonda Lee Chapman joins us from Washington, D.C. Um, she is currently working and serving there as the Equity Director for the Trust for Public Land for all 30 of their offices nationwide. Um, and she is here tonight to share some of her work and some of her story with you and also to help us spark a community conversation here about some tricky questions about how we start to decolonize our mindsets and our, our programming around how we design public spaces so that they are truly for everyone and accessible to everyone. Um, so without further ado, please help me welcome Rhonda Lee Chapman. This land is your land. Everybody. 
<clears throat> I'm Rhonda, and I'm feeling overwhelmed with emotion right now. Um, and I think that's part of our, our collective opportunity to think about how emotions can show up and how meaningful this work really is. So um, thank you for letting me be here. Thanks for inviting me to take up some time. I think I'm going to take up a whole hour of your, of your life. And uh, I think it's uh, truly my sincere hope that everybody here walks away with one thing that you can take home to your family, that you can take to your friends, that you can take to your community, that is a positive thing, something that can be transformational in some way. So um, before we move on, I want to take the time to acknowledge the land that we're occupying. Um, it's the place that we're calling Tennessee. And I think it's fair to say that none of us really asked for permission to occupy this space. None of us asked for permission. I know I certainly didn't ask for permission to even be here. Um, I never met with any of the local tribe members. I don't know who knows I'm here. And so I'd like to just take a moment to say thank you to all the generations of this land's first peoples, including the Cherokee, including the Chickasaw, who I understand have a, a very prominent presence here in this region. So just needed to get that out of the way. Very important to me. Uh, the other consideration I'd like to acknowledge is about accessibility. Um, as we explore today, we have so many layers of our identities, my identities, your identities. Some of them are visible, some of them are invisible, some of them are private, some of them are very public. And as we were so excited in this instance in getting this organized, uh, we didn't offer to provide any accommodations for anyone's needs. So I'm hopeful that everybody can hear me clearly. I'm hopeful that we don't have any linguistic barriers, but I apologize that we didn't take that into account. Um, that is not truly how we have an inclusive experience, and so I just want to acknowledge that right now and say I'm sorry. All right. <clears throat> Y'all might not know, but I'm actually really hilarious and laid back. <laughs> And I love to dance, and I'm being serious as all get out right now, so let me just talk a little bit more and shake that seriousness off a little bit. Um, a little bit more bit of business, but this now is about how we are talking to each other. This now is about the space that we're sharing right now. Uh, by a show of hands, can any of you, uh, can you raise your hand if you're familiar with what a community agreement is? Oftentimes, I see a few, oftentimes these are uh, a process that is undertaken when we're doing a workshop or we're you know, doing some thought leadership and we're all gonna have different um, opportunities to exchange our ideas, right? And very often, uh, a community agreements are something that are co-created. So we all come into an understanding and we give a thumbs up or a thumb sideways or a thumbs down. But basically, it's our contract. So we're all about to enter into a social contract for the next hour or so. Very oftentimes, when these community agreements are created, um, there are very common themes around respect and things around um, not taking up too much space, things about confidentiality, right? But tonight, we're not really doing that kind of exchange. Right now, this is a little bit more didactic, if you will. And so, what I did want us, though, to invite you to consider are these very particular community agreements. And I know, gosh, for me, that's pretty small. Um, so I'm gonna read these out loud to you. And these are also really important because in a little bit, we're gonna have two other guests come up and talk and, and we wanna make sure that we honor this whole experience. And so one of them that we're all gonna to agree to that I implore of you is to listen to understand. As we're all sitting here together, practice love and empathy and compassion and vulnerability and humility and curiosity for yourself, for me, for everybody sitting around us. And this one's a really difficult one, particularly for someone like myself, and that is to expect and accept non-closure. 
we're not going to walk out of this room with all the answers to all of the problems, particularly around our colonized mindsets and the way we go about moving through our cities and towns. So just sit with that and just realize that we're not coming to any conclusions today, but we will have an understanding. I can promise you that. I also want to invite you all to take responsibility for your own learning and to recognize the burden that people with marginalized identities endure. And the reason why this one, for me, speaking, you know, going back to this traditional uh, commitment about using I statements, the reason why this one's particularly appoint, important for me is one, you can Google anything you want. <laughs> It's not the, it's, when we're working with communities that are often marginalized for all of the reasons that we'll, we'll talk about some of them today, it's really not our responsibility to give you all the education. We have books, scholars, magazines, again, Google, 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 you can find the answers. And also, that's just as important, Remember that people like myself, people with marginalized identities, have contributions and perspectives that are often overlooked. So can I see some head nods? Like, is this gonna work for y'all? All right, awesome. So this conversation, as you know, and I think it's why you're here, is about reimagining our relationship to place and we're going to invite each other to think about some of the ways that we can decolonize our minds and our designs in a way that inspires our collective well-being. And so in the moment, some of you might be sitting with like, I have no idea. I only came to get what the heck these words mean. And so we're going to talk about it a couple of ways. Um, I'm going to break it down by sharing a definition. Some of us like to hear very technical information. We want to know who the source is. We want to know the exactitude of the language, and I've got a little bit of that for you. Um, I'm going to also share a story that serves as, I think, a pretty good example of what we want to kind of learn. And then we're also going to talk about it in conversation. So um, my sisters, Daniela and Fabiana, are going to join us in just a little bit to also tell their story, because I'm from DC. I'm here. I'm an interloper of sorts. I have the, the, the grounding truths around the principles and the importance of this work, but I'm not, I don't live in Chattanooga. So we need to hear from the people who do. So that's what's gonna happen in a little bit. So, y'all with me? You, do you believe that I'm actually funny? Awesome, thank you, I promise. But wait till seven o'clock. And I'm able to have a glass of wine, you'll see. So, <laughs> so, so I'm gonna read to you this definition, and this is from a wonderful resource called Beautiful Trouble, and it's thusly. Colonization is an historic and ongoing form of territorial, economic, and mental conquest in which one group of indigenous people or the first inhabitants of a place, so this can be in our neighborhood, is subordinated and put in service to another group of people under the forces of imperialism. Decolonization is a set of ideas and lived experiences that challenge that imperialism through forms of bottom-up disobedience, to historical and ongoing colonization. Theories and manifestations of decolonization prioritize indigenous or non-Western forms of knowledge, spirituality, cultural practices, and sovereignty. Okay, it's a lot, right? So in a more simplified version, and this is kind of uh, Rhonda's riff on what those words kind of embody for me. It really means that we honor the full humanity of one another, which means that we have a collective vision in which we are seen, where we are in relationship, where we agree to relinquish our space, we will agree to relinquish our power when it becomes imbalanced. 
And it can mean that when we're designing a park, for example, that we have to get outside our very talented, our very educated, our very visionary minds and think also about the user's experience. We need to think about the user's desires and we also need to think about the user's ability to define and decide the terms of the engagement and the terms of the effort, right? Some folks will simplify this and call it community engagement. That's a part of it, but there's so much more to it. And so in my opinion, and I hope that you agree, to decolonize our minds and our practices also means that we do not engage in the practice of erasure. It means that we put forth all of our best efforts to apologize fully when we've done harm. It means that we do not pathologize any members of the communities that we say we want to uplift. And it means that we stop limiting our narratives to those of deficit. And instead, we focus also on attributes. We focus on the assets of community. We focus on the ingrained resilience of the places where we're entering. And that we say thank you. That we share our resources with community without question and without competition. It means that when we put our heads to rest at the end of the day, I'm watching some faces, which is a lot. Um, that we have peace in our hearts because we did not impose our will on anyone. We did not demand perfectionism for things that we do not understand or recognize. We did not force a sense of urgency because we're so entrenched in this grind culture. You gotta work until your knuckles are bleeding, right? It's not healthy. And it means that we're not defensive. Hear me out. It means that we're not defensive when someone calls us out on the harm that the structures of supremacy upholds. It means that we do not hoard our power, but we share it instead. Yeah? Okay. And the other thing that is also, I think, pretty true is that bigger isn't always better and quantity does not supersede quality, and feelings and emotions are just as important as logic. We're talking about a lived experience, right? We're talking about what people have come to realize, and including, and we'll get to this, the information that's passed down to us genetically. I am carrying stories of ancestors that I've never met. I'm coded. I am coded with their stories and I always reach out to them and ask for the good stories. I don't want to carry the trauma. I want to carry the leadership, the innovation, the love, the joy. Those are the only pieces that I want, but I can't pick and choose all the time, right? So, now you guys want a practical example, I imagine. Because <laughs> this sounds kind of smushy, gushy, wushy, right? This is, <laughs> this is like something I should be talking about in one of my little like yoga circles or something like that. <laughs> but it is true. It just makes you a little uncomfortable sometimes. So to get us started, I want to give you a, uh, a practical example. This is a real life story um, about the ways we can de decolonize our minds and some of our place making designs. And this took place in my hometown of DC just a few years ago. And it's an example of where intent and impact are very misaligned, and it happens. It happens all the time. We have so many good ideas. We're just doing the right thing, right? Sometimes we don't think it all the way through. So we come in, we've got an agenda, and we've got this vision, right? So in DC, like in many urban uh, areas here in the United States, um, we've got poverty. Right? We've got a particular community, we call it East of the River in Washington, D.C. How many folks have been to D.C.? How many folks know where the Anacostia River is? Awesome. Are y'all planners? No? Okay. 
So in D.C., we have two major rivers. We've got the Potomac River and the Anacostia River, for those of you who don't know. And the Anacostia River tends to be the Great Divide. And I, I call it it's the divider between Black D.C. and White D.C., period. It's very rare that people who are coming in to visit for all of the cultural experiences make it to that side of the community. And so some folks, um, and, and that's where we have all the disparatives, that's where all the deficit stories are based out of, and that's where we've got like, the highest concentrations of poverty. And some, some folks in the city planning office noticed that there wasn't a lot of public art. And they thought, I know, let's install some public art. And they decided that um, they wanted... <laughs> They wanted to do an art project at one of the busiest bus stops in DC, in this particular neighborhood. It is a very, very heavily utilized space. And so what they decided to do was put out a call for proposals, right? Did the good old RFP, if you will. And it was for um, uh, some sort of public art installation to be located there, right? And what I wanna share with you was a couple of the red flags about this effort. The first flag was that the well-intended city staff had determined and prioritized a need on behalf of the community rather than basing it on something the community asked for. You nod your head, how common is that? 100%, happens all the time, right? I've been a part of it, trust me. I'm not totally innocent either. So that's the first red flag, and I'm, I'm willing to guess that the community probably would have articu articulated a different set of needs. Probably don't really need an art installation at this bus stop. The second flag, and this is all my opinion, okay, so you know, don't be calling Mayor Bowser <laughs> and, and chewing her out, right? This is my opinion, but this is very much a true story. So the second flag was that after putting out the RFP, after putting out the request for proposals, the city awarded the project to a firm. Guess where they were located? Not Seattle, Washington. The other Washington, 3,000 miles away. 3,000 miles away. And this is for a very localized artistic effort that needed to re represent and reflect the people who live and utilize this space, right? So now, not only are these individuals, this firm, all good people, this isn't, this isn't a shame game, right? This is no, not just casting dispersions on these individuals, but now we have local dollars going out the door. It's leaving the community. And I don't know if y'all know this about DC, we have some of the most amazing artists of every type that you can ask for, any media, we've got it in DC. So then the other flag, and it's probably due to this 3,000 mile disconnection, is that the firm never engaged with the community that utilizes the bus stop. They just had an idea, right? So they didn't as assess or observe how people use the space, they didn't study who was using it, they didn't ask what they wanted, but had they done so, they would have noticed that there aren't enough spaces at the bus stop for people to sit. The buses run pretty infrequently, and so you're standing and standing, and we have people of different abilities. We've got children, we've got folks that are carrying tons and tons of groceries because, oh, by the way, we only have three grocery stores to serve 7,000 people in this very same community, right? But the firm, inadvertently, was imposing their will, they were imposing their vision, their detached imagination on a community that they have zero relationship with. It's kind of like when you get in a boat and you go to a land and you take it over, right? <laughs> so <laughs> the result ended up being this really beautiful sculpture. And that sculpture ended up being <laughs> where the kids played, it's the thing where everybody hung their grocery bags, it was where people were just using it to satisfy whatever need they had at the moment. That's cool, that happens, right? It's not functional art, but here's where the things got really messed up. 
city staff, after the sculpture had been up for a while, decided like, oh, let's go see, you know, this effort. Let's go and, and cruise and check out the, the sculpture at the bus stop. And what they saw that it had been tagged, it was kind of fallen apart. It had gotten weatherized, which was not the responsibility of the people who used the bus stop. But they decided that the people, they don't care about art. They don't like art, so they took it away. And that became the narrative of this place. Don't invest here because they don't like art. That is a tiny, tiny, tiny example. I think this whole effort was maybe like 25 grand, right? That's a tiny example of what colonization of place can look like, regardless of our good intentions. And it was a failed process, which yielded a failed outcome, which then led to a false narrative, right? Are any of us here for that? You know, have any of us been a part of that? I have. I certainly have. So there's many layers beyond that example. And since our time is short, we've got about 30 minutes or so left. So I think this is, where the, this is really where the magic happens. Um, we only have a time to touch on three themes in this conversation. Um, and we might have some space for a little bit more. We'll see how this goes. But the themes that we're going to be talking about, kind of if you can reflect on some of the things I said earlier, are around erasure. We're going to talk about belonging and we're going to talk about an asset-based narrative, okay? All right. So I would love to call on my friends, Daniela and Fabiana. Will you guys please come join me now? I think these two are really the reason why you came. <laughs> I don't blame you. Um, are you comfy? Yeah, oh, do whatever you need. Awesome. Yeah, okay, cool. I want to take a moment and also invite you all to observe uh, something that I think, or we think maybe, I shouldn't speak for you all, that's very important, and that is that we've got three women who are representing three Americas sitting here right now together to talk to you about how we interpret, how we live, how we experience colonized spaces and colonized mindsets. And we're really, really prayerful that y'all walk away with a much, much clearer understanding of what it is that we're doing here. Yeah? You agree? Cool. So, Daniela Paz-Peterson. There are so many of you who already know her. Um, she's a community strategist with the Trust for Public Land. She's a senior advisor here in our Chattanooga office. She's more than just that. These are just titles that we assign people. It just happens to be one of the things that are attached to her name and her, her whole amazing, beautiful self. Um, you've been collaborating here in the community for the last couple of years, yeah? And you are actually the mastermind behind these family photos. So I think I've been, I've been watching people smile and giggle as we have this role of beautiful pictures. Um, and, and Daniela is really the mastermind behind that. We're going to get into that in just a moment. And Fabiana Miguel Gaspar. Um, I don't know how many of you haven't had an opportunity to meet and talk with Fabiana. Fabiana is a third culture child. And she's also a Chattanooga res uh, resident. She's been here for about 23 years. She has the honor, and they have the honor, to work with her with uninsured patients um, through the um, uh, LifeSpring Health Service. She's a, a public health community health worker. <laughs> I'm getting all tripped up on all the words. Hey, Amen. Essential service all day. And a lot of what Fabiana does is around bridging the gaps in individuals' needs that are often overlooked in these, these oppressive systems that we all exist within. So we're going to hear more. I'm going to talk less. And uh, I want to turn to you, Fabiana. And I first want to thank you 
for sharing your, um, a piece of yourself with us. I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank you for your energy and your love and your care. And um, I want to ask you if you can please share the story of your name. We're talking about erasure here, and I would love for you all to share with these folks the story of your name. Do you mind? Yes. Um, so I'm going to give a little bit education of what is um, why my name is important, um, and especially in the Hispanic community or Latino or indigenous. Um, more, more mainly focus on our indigenous heritage. Um, so I am named after my grandmother. As a firstborn daughter of my two parents, um, it's traditional to name the firstborn gender-wise. If it's a son or a daughter, it's always named after um, the grandparents of the dad side. Then there goes the second child, is named after the grandparents uh, of the mom's side, whether a boy or girl. So if it was a girl, it would be named after the grandmother. If it was a boy, it would be named after the grandfather. Or more typically, it's more named after the father, if it was a boy. And with that in mind, I take the honor to represent my grandma. Um, it's a heavy weight at the same time. Uh, when we get gatherings uh, with my family, um, I'm mostly be like the honor one that comes in in the room. Oh, here comes our mother. So my uncles and, and aunts come and say, here comes our mother. I was like, I'm just your niece. But, but that's an honor to bring that in into the room um, just because our, my grandmother is not with us, but it's just an honor for her and just the resilience that she has gone through um, to raise um, her children and be there for her children. And so with the last names, we carry both of our, um, both family tree um, from our, my parents. So um, originally we we're supposed to take the first last name. We have two last names. So we take the first last name of my dad, and then after the first last name of my mom. So 1988, I was born and I, in, in Colorado. So anyone who is from Colorado, give me a hoo-hoo. Uh, but um, I love the Rocky Mountains. Um, then I, um, I was born, my dad, um, obviously such an advocate, but at the same time, trying to explain to nurses how our last name function. And it was, it was it's frustrating. Um, unfortunately, my registered name in my documents here in the States, I don't carry the last names of my grandfather. I take the last names of my grandmothers um, because the nurses back in the 80s were not educated or they were ignorant of n just respecting the ownership of this heritage or culture or individual. And so um, that's why my name is Miguel Gaspar. So Miguel is my mom's second last name and my dad's last second last name. Um, so my original name should be Fabiana Tomas Tomas. Um, so with that in mind, the, the nurses were trying to tell my dad, here in the States, we don't do that. We only take the last names. And so obviously because in the indigenous, we already have that mindset of complacency and we're like, okay, I guess we'll do it the way how you guys do it. But I really want the last names of my, some la two last names for my daughter. So Miguel Gaspar is what I have and I take it in ownership to represent both of my grandmothers. And by heart, I take my grandfathers. And so thankfully, <laughs> I take that as an exit of 
gratitude, um, sharing, showing grace that I got, get to honor all four of my grandparents. And so with this story, I'm really grateful, but grieving at the same time. So this was a situation where you have long-standing tradition, generations of tradition. You're born here in the United States, but because we don't do that here, we decided to erase that tradition and give you what we thought was the best because it was the most convenient and it was based on something that we simply didn't understand, right? So we overshadowed what your father was asking and we gave you something that you didn't really truly want and it broke tradition. And so now you have to manifest that on your own. Yeah. Daniela. It's happening. <laughs> it's happening. <laughs> you know, um, I know that you have some reflections on the ways erasures have been a part of your lived experience. Do you mind sharing? Yeah. Um, thank you for being here. Um, I'm going to do my best to honor your time. Um, something that Rhonda didn't mention that I'm from the land of Mapuche, Inca, Aymara, Atacameño, Chango, now known as Chile. So I'm Chilean, New American, and something that many of you don't know that I'm also a descendant of indigenous people. Um, that's something very personal because the people that I descend, uh, we can trace them. Um, so I can name Amachi, I can, I can name them specifically, but I know they were the Mapuche. Um, so that's an intersection of all of what I am. Chilean, I'm New American, I'm indigenous. Um, and why that is important to say, why it is important that we need to name things because for a long time, for most part of my life, I thought colonization was something that happened so, so long ago. So it was a process that I wasn't part of that. But when we start thinking about how we carry stories and how we carry our ancestors, we realize colonization keep happening. Invasion happened, but colonization keep happening. And colonization is not just a colonizer, which funny fact for me. It was like, I also involved in that process. My mind, my way of thinking still colonize, and I'm the one that is doing it for me. And I think that is so important to like, it's not just blaming the other person, it's how we do to keep doing it. And that's such a personal process, but I think it has to be spoken. It has to be put it out there um, to see who is doing it for us, and if you are doing it for yourself. Thank you. Does anybody just, I just wasn't planning on doing this, I'm gonna do it now, because I wanna make sure y'all are with me, with us, right? When we think about erasure, um, I know as a black American, I can only go back to my grandparents. Like, we got here and we were completely void of any identification outside of the size of our body, where we came from, whether we could bear children, um, and that was it. We were numbers, we were given names that were not our own, so it's really, really hard to trace the roots for many of us black Americans. And so there's erasure upon erasure upon erasure happening there too, and there's a lot of envy that happens occasionally when I'm talking to my white friends and colleagues about their family stories and how far back everybody can go in these amazing stories about the name changes. And we came to the United States and my grandfather didn't want to have a Jewish name, so he changed it to Johnson so that he could be safe, et cetera, et cetera. Stories of triumph and resilience and overcome, right? Those are beautiful, important stories. And I'm also jealous sometimes. So I wonder if any of you, just by a show of hands, has any relationship with any element of erasure in your family story? Just a couple of you. I think it hurts, personally. And again, as Daniela was just saying, it's also a mindset. It's also a mindset, and we'll get to that in just a little bit. So on the fun side, right, <laughs> let's lighten up a little bit, lighten up Rhonda. Um, 
I'm really interested in you all sharing the story about the two of you meeting. And we're, gonna, we're bringing it back to the family photos. And um, it would be helpful if you like, shared some context around that and then told the story. Yeah, cool. Um, so how we met, I didn't know Fabiana. And we were doing this project in the Islay Park. Uh, and that project, it's one of my favorites. Um, it's something, nothing new. We didn't reinvent the wheel. Uh, it's something if you have it in South America, Central America, we actually take pictures in parks. And normally we have a llama or a donkey. Hopefully someday here we're going to have that. But so far, and right now, we just take pictures with Brooke Bragger, the photographer, and we go around parks taking pictures of people. Um, and in their very first uh, event in Islay Park, on a Sunday morning, this badass Latina woman show up in a skateboard right there. And I was like, I need to know her. And who is this? Uh, so I just introduced myself. We started talking. We took her picture. Um, and then we kept connected. But the thing is, like, why do we do this? Why do we do pictures of people at parks? And one, we want to make smile people, like it, it's a sweet. They are like amazing pictures and they are memories. Uh, but the thing behind, to be honest you, back in the time when I asked myself, imagine a family in a park. My first imagine, it wasn't myself and my family. It was like a nuclear family, most of the time white. So the narrative that create, we create in public space, who occupies public space, who do we imagine there, uh, is it's normally not myself. So we take the pictures for people to see ourselves there and for other people to see ourselves. Um, so that's kind of like the intentionality behind of all of this. And I also really enjoy doing it. But <laughs> and so it's around belonging, right? This is the second, this is that second element and that is belonging. Yeah, that belonging in a personal perspective I think belonging when you don't have to explain yourself, where you can just be. Uh, and in order for, to do that, I think it's, it's necessary that we can see ourselves there so I can feel that I'm part of that and I can be myself completely. Yeah, I appreciate that. Fabiana, when you think about belonging and in the terms of either the work that you're doing as a, a leader in community health, or if you're thinking about it in your more social context, what, is, what does belonging look like for you in these spaces? Um, for me, belonging means um, honoring dignity of a human being. Um, and how I play that in the role of my work is giving the dignity or honoring the dignity of an individual as I go to their homes, as I go and hang out in a park with the family members that I interact with. Um, for me, uh, as I go into these homes, I come with humility mm -hmm. and just interact with them as meet them as where they at. Can you, can you do us a favor and tell us the story that your, your grandfather told you about eating? Oh, so my dad, actually. Your dad, okay. My dad. Um, so obviously in a very Mayan culture, um, obviously because we are very indigenous and we have trauma from the colonization from the Spaniards. And so... Um, as my parents were raising me here in the States, um, it was a little bit difficult to be um, part of America because I go to these schools, right? And so I eat their food. I learn, especially when I moved here in the South, was really interesting. Um, and, and my dad, like, um, was very an advocate of being friends with other people. And what he said, we only trust those who eat like us. And, and so for me, as a child of his, I adapted that quote. And so when I interact with white Americans, which was a really interesting um, 
um, culture shock for me, but it was really nice for me to get to know the white community and got to learn how to eat casseroles, how to make sweet, <laughs> sweet tea, uh, sandwiches as they eat, and, and also as here in the Chattanooga culture, we are so well known to wear the chacos in these kavu bags, you know? <laughs> and so I got to immerse myself and made some awesome friends in the white community. And as in the black community, I did that as well. I adapted in that culture. I ate with them. I got to learn to my black fellow African American friends. They love their barbecues yes. <laughs> and their fried chicken and their corn cobs and their greens. <laughs> and they know how to party as well. And and then I started to get into more um, cultures, not just my Guatemalan culture. I also got to learn my Mayan culture as well when I moved here in Chattanooga. It was an interesting fact uh, because I got to learn how to eat like a Mexican, not a, as a Guatemalan. <laughs> it was a really interesting factor there as well. But I had the opportunity to get to adapt in these different cultures and get to know a lot of people in different cultures and be able to hear their stories. But they trusted me because I was, I ate like them. So you, had a, you had an experience of belonging. You were able to come in and connect and you didn't come in and tell them that what they were eating wasn't, you didn't judge it. Mm -mm. No. You didn't walk in with your own plate <laughs> of something that you prefer. <laughs> Just in case there's potato salad with raisins in it. <laughs> <laughs> you right. didn't do any of that. Yep. <laughs> um, so again, we're talking about erasure and how we can plan and design to make sure that we're not um, doing that. We have so much presence, there's so much place, and we want to make sure that the work that we're doing is purposeful and that it's reflective. And we also need to know that we're creating a sense of belonging. We've got time check right now. Um, so there's a couple of things that maybe you all can stay five minutes over because we started five minutes late and I'm going to pull a Maxine Waters and reclaim my time. <laughs> uh, yeah. I know we have 10, but I'm asking for 15. Yeah. <laughs> Reclaiming my time. So um, one of the things we're going to talk about to kind of close out with these themes is around the asset narrative. So again, I understand what it means to want to do good in community. I understand what it means when we go into a place and we measure it against our own personal lived standards and the privileges that I'll say I, the privileges that I carry, right? But does that have to be the only story that we tell about a place, right? So when we talk about the way we're framing our inclusion, or the way we're framing our design, the way we're framing, the way we're determining the places that we want to work in, there's more than a deficit narrative. There are assets there. We just need to understand, going back to what we said about this um, through the, the community agreement, that marginalized communities have a whole lot to offer. We got talent, we have innovation, we have resources that you've never thought of, right? So we need to tap into that when we're thinking about where we're gonna install a park. A park sometimes is just a place. It's the things that happen in that place that matter. It's the experience in that place that really, really matter. And we can't tell people how to use it, right? So, Daniela, this is very important <laughs> to me. So recently we were having a conversation and you shared some frustration about how um, communities that are you know, black, indigenous, uh, other people of color are seen as a project with a problem rather than a community of possibilities. Preach on that. Um, <laughs> whoa, whoa. Word. Um, it's a simple exercise. When you look into indicators, when you look into service, or normally, most of the time, when we are put out there in numbers, it's because we are a problem. 
um, is because we are unsure, like Latino community, that we are undocumented, illegal, um, black community, incarcerated. So each time that we, they put ourselves out there, it feels like it's because they don't know what to do with us. But at the same time, with that logic of like problem that you need to solve, that we need to solve, we also open the door for exceptional, exceptionalism. What I mean by this, if you are on a problem, you have to be exceptional mm -hmm. in order to be there. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm trying to really center the conversation about my I statement, how that manifests in me is the way that I show up. I have to be exceptional. I have to justify what, I, what I'm here. I, because I'm an immigrant. So the way that we show up, it's like, we need to be justifying ourselves all the time. And when we think about exceptionalism too, is because we think we have so little of something that is not enough for everyone. So because we don't have enough for everyone, you have to be very special to get it. And that, a friend of mine uh, taught me that that's a value when you don't have enough of something and you think that the people that should get that of that, they should be special, that, that's a supremacist value. So that was my friend Sarah Verstaki, that she's not here. So again, when we talk about colonization, when we talk about supremacist thinking, um, it's really easy to point fingers, but it's harder to think that you are doing it to yourself. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of what I've been wrestling lately. Yeah, an internalized depression. Um, it's, it's for another conversation. Faviana, um, I'm trying to wrap this up, I know. Um, one of the things I'd love for you to share with us are what people can sometimes overlook or mischaracterize about some of the communities that you're working with, right? You already just shared with us, like you go into the communities and you commune around food, the common food, and you share. But there are other parts of the, um, the people in the communities that you're working with that are assets but they get overlooked. Can you talk to us about what some of those might be? Yes, um, which both of you guys touched um, the most important topics that I, I was sharing. A lot of people, I do it as well, we overlook of that an individual has always brings something into the table. We overlook that. Um, we overlook their dignity. Um, and which covers a lot of the things, the majority of what we overlook, even in the small things. And when we do that, um, when we overlook, it, it's just, it builds up walls a lot. And so that's what I've noticed um, whenever, um, I don't overlook that, and I see that persons, um, that they bring something to the table. It's like, it, I get astonished what they bring in the table, and their dignity, how um, their worth is, and how important it is to empower their worth and their dignity. Yeah. We overlook things like the innovation and resilience that communities have. I'll tell you, I, st I started cutting my teeth working in local government when I lived in Portland, Oregon, and I was a sustainability generalist, right? And this was back in the early 2000s, and sustainability was becoming the thing, right? And so we started coming up with these new in 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 incentives for people in the, com in the city to start behaving a certain way. So take the bus, ride your bike. And we started creating these reward platforms for people. And like one of the jobs that I had working for a local government, we would get um, a certificate to REI if we made a commitment to, to use mass transit or walk to get to work, right? In the meantime, we've got people, usually people of color, usually people of lower wealth that are living outside of the job 
uh, uh, circle, right? The concentrated, what's the word? You know, where all the jobs are in town, what's the word? I'm starting to get tired, I think. They're taking the bus every day. <laughs> They're taking it out of necessity for a whole host of reasons. It's about proximity, it's about the wages that they're earning, but do they get the award? Do they get that certificate to REI for doing what they have to do all the time? We have so much privilege, y'all, but we don't think about it in that way, right? We get so, in, so caught up in, in all of the niceties that we have, and we feel good. We feel so good, like, look what I did. I, I'm a bike commuter, I'm not throwing any shade, and I have a car. Right? And I have one of the best mass transit systems. But do I deserve a cookie? <laughs> do I? I don't know that I do. And so we overlook the fact that people are taking three buses into the job corridor. They've got to drop off a kid, and then they have to transfer, and then heaven help them if the bus line breaks down or decides that it's gonna stop running, at, stop running at midnight and they can't get back to the place they need to be. There's so many things, right? But they become innovative. They reach out to their networks, they find solutions. And we don't give credit for that. So there's a lot of times when we're overlooking, again, because we're thinking about the deficit, but we're not thinking about the innovation, we're not thinking about the creativity. And we overlook the fact that you know, we've been, we joke around in, in the black community, we've been using plastic bags over and over and over and over again since plastic bags were invented. <laughs> I, we, you know, they have a, life, a lifespan that goes for decades almost. I think I've got my first bag when I was 12. That's, that's a lie, but um, we, need to, we need to wrap this up and um, put these bad boys on at seven o'clock. I asked for four, now I got four more minutes. <laughs> um, I wanna, I'm gonna do like facilitator's choice and I would like to invite Eric up. Yep. And he kind of knew that it was coming. He wasn't totally sure. I hadn't decided it was a momentary thing. And um, come on. Let's stand together. How about that? You help create this process, right? This civic dialogue, this civic engagement. And I know that you already have an existing relationship with Daniela and the Trust for Public Land, and we're so glad. And I think sometimes when we think about what it means to be accountable, to some of the things that we've talked about today, that also means that we have to have courage. And I think accountability does take courage, but again, it's not, you don't necessarily get a cookie for doing what's right, um, but it does take a lot of bravery. And so I'm curious, I'm gonna put you on the spot, and I'm gonna think about, ask you to think about when we talk about erasure, when we talk about belonging, and when we talk about like an asset narrative and we think about the work that's coming out of the Chattanooga Design Studio, I'm really curious to see if you have any reflections on some things that you heard today that you kind of want to ponder and maybe utilize as a way to like shift a practice or shift a narrative inside the design studio with you and your team. So, um I think many of you know that we've um, been working um, at Pat and Porch recently on public space improvements and um, working really, really uh, diligently to involve primarily residents involved in the conversation about what we've termed their porch. And um, it occurs to me, I, I think, that at this inflection point when most of the residents if not all of the residents have been displaced to somewhere else in our community due to a fire, that it gives pause for the Chattanooga Design Studio. And we've been really as a team struggling with this to think about what does that mean about place when all of a sudden you live in a hotel for six months and then you get to return to your place, which isn't necessarily your place, but you think that this is a restorative place to do restorative things that we all need to do with our humanity. 
Um, and so what I've heard tonight a lot is um, that we need to lean in more on the things that we've been doing, I think, that are a little bit non-traditional urban design, which is showing up and cooking together, having a meal, and sharing and understanding one another by breaking bread with one another, and doing that at the same time as understanding our cultures and where we come from because of the place that we live today is it the place that we've all come from and we've not done enough of that. We've not done enough of that to really, really help, I think, a part of our community that needs help. And um, that's where I'm inflecting tonight. It's where I kind of where I'm sitting and um, we've, we've been in a motion towards that and I really, really appreciate this conversation tonight. Fabiana, what you said was fantastic. Daniela, you always wake me up to a new way to think, and tonight you've done it again. Rhonda, first time I met you, you challenged me to think differently tonight, even again. And so I just want to thank you, ladies. Uh, this has been really, really rewarding for me, and I hope that you all agree that this has been a fantastic conversation and that there's something for you to take away. Thank you. Thank you. That's awesome. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so we're at time, and I want to thank you all for bearing with us. This is a really vulnerable thing to do, um, to come into a place and try to build a relationship and to just give you some opinions and work with some beautiful human beings. Um, I just want to wish to you all that you stay safe. I want to invite you all to act with love. And I want you to take some courage. Be bold, be brave, be humble. And make sure that you can sleep well at night, knowing that you did your best every day. And with that, I think we're going to close out with some music. This land is your land.